uh, to celebrate the memory of a man who was a close friend for 20 years. He was a noble man and has made outstanding intellectual contributions to the theory of human rights and to clarifying the counterpart responsibilities that such rights entail, using his economics training to deepen our understanding of the practical political implications of social and economic rights and to develop a highly original account of the right to development. He has been entrusted with the mainstreaming and implementation of human rights at the highest levels of national and international governance, serving with distinction in a large number of high-level human rights-related positions in India as well as within the United Nations system. In developing and industrialized countries alike, even when such forthrightness was unpopular and thus associated with personal costs. I have uh, encountered Arjun Sen Gupta in many different roles, in the most illustrious universities, in the United Nations, working in Geneva, and in his work for the poor in India in the unorganized sector. Along with many others, I will miss his wisdom, his courage, and his consistent engagement for the most vulnerable people in India and abroad. But we will continue his work. I also want to congratulate all of you, and especially uh, your Vice Chancellor Rash Kumar, for being part of the founding generation of this very unique university. It's really rare that you encounter in the world something that wouldn't exist if one person hadn't willed it into existence. And so I really admire Rash Kumar for this incredible effort to create something that maybe five years ago, everybody would have thought absolutely impossible. So 50 years from now, I predict people will tell the story and will say this is a point where India changed in an important way. A legend is born here and you are part of the founding generation. I hope you appreciate that. I, wouldn't you like to be in the first generation at Harvard or Stanford? All right, so let's talk about the human right to be free from poverty. I'll start you off with a few statistics about poverty, and uh, it's often thought that poverty is no longer much of a problem because there's been so much growth, so much economic progress and technological progress. So it's often thought that this is the problem from, yeah, it works. Wow. Uh, it's a problem from another era, that economic growth, technological progress has been so profound that there's very little poverty left and what little pockets are left is rapidly disappearing. But if you look at the statistics, you'll see that they tell a different story. Almost a billion people, probably more than a billion this year, are still chronically undernourished. Two billion lack access to essential medicines. Almost a billion lack access to safe drinking water. Another billion lack access to adequate shelter. 1.6 billion have no electricity. Two and a half billion lack adequate sanitation. 800 million adults are illiterate and more than 200 million children are doing wage work outside their families, often under really quite horrendous conditions. So the poverty problem is still with us, and I think it is all the more shameful, given that today, in contrast to earlier times, it is almost entirely avoidable. At least one-third of all human deaths are due to poverty-related causes. This is, again, a statistic that may surprise many of you. It's certainly a statistic that Westerners find surprising. And this statistic is conservative. I have developed it simply by counting all those deaths that are from causes that are essentially unknown among the affluent, among the affluent in India, as well as among the affluent in Europe, North America, and Japan. These are the causes, and you can see here the death figures in thousands. 18 million people die from these causes of death that 
with a little bit of wealth, proper nutrition, clean water, you could entirely avoid. Of course, poor people also die from causes that are only too well known among the affluent, like cancer, for example, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. And often they die much sooner than we do. But those deaths I've not even counted among the 18 million. So you get to one third of all human deaths by just counting these typically poverty-related causes. If you put that in perspective, somewhere around 370, 380 million people have died from poverty-related causes since the end of the Cold War. And that figure simply dwarfs all the great catastrophes of the 20th century, the wars, the civil wars, the gulags, the concentration camps, all of which together amounted to just 200 million deaths. That's a huge number, of course. I'm not trying to belittle it. I'm just trying to say that the poverty problem is even larger. In 20 years, twice as many. Now, we have, of course, human rights. And the human right that is by far the most under-realized in the world today is formulated in Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where we commit ourselves as the humanity to this right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of oneself and one's family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. So here's a human right that we are all committed to, and yet it is massively, massively underfulfilled for more than half the human population. Now, let us ask why that happens. Why in a world in which the global average income is quite nice, why is it true that still so many people suffer from hunger and all these other poverty-related deprivations? You see the superficial answer here. That is the global household income distribution. What I've done here is divided the world into four quarters, the world's population, irrespective of nationality. And the blue is the top quarter, subdivided into the top 5% at the top, and the next 20% a little darker at the bottom. And you see with one glance what the problem is. The problem is that the bottom quarter doesn't get much of the pizza. They get 0.78% of global household income, a really, truly, ridiculously small amount. What this slide also shows you is how avoidable poverty has become. How small in economic terms the problem is. Massive as it is in human terms, quite small in economic terms. So just imagine doubling the income of all the people in the bottom quarter. Doubling it sounds like a very big task, but it's only three quarters of 1% of global household income. It's not a big deal. And even if you try to double the entire bottom half, it wouldn't be such a big deal. So poverty today is very different from the poverty 100 or even 50 years ago in that it is much, much more avoidable than it ever was. Another thing that you see on this table here, I apologize for the slightly messy numbers, but you're all, I think, used to numbers and statistics. This shows you the development of inequality over the 17 years from 1988 to 2005. So the second column repeats the information that you've already seen on the pie chart. But here you see how that inequality emerged and how rapidly it emerged between 1988 and 2005. You see here that only the top ventile, the top 5% of the world's population, had a gain in that 17-year period, capturing an additional 3.5% of global household income. The second ventile more or less stayed flat, and all the other ventiles, all the other 20ths of the world's population, lost ground. The further down, the more ground they lost. The bottom quarter lost not much in absolute terms, but a huge amount in relative terms. They lost about one-third of their share of global household income. And that is, again, the answer why poverty persists to such a large extent. It persists 
because if you lose a third of your share of global household income over a 17 year period, rising average income, a rising size of the pizza, is not going to be able to overcome that headwind. You see also here how large inequality has become. Those in the top 5% have nine times the global average income. Those in the bottom quarter, 132nd. So the income differential between those two groups is about 300 to 1. 300 people in the bottom quarter have about as much income as one person in the top 5%. Now here is, again, a dynamic picture of the development of severe poverty. Poverty is measured in many different ways. The World Bank has an incredibly complicated way of measuring it, but I prefer a concrete and tangible way of measuring it. Just look at how many people are chronically undernourished. It's a much more honest statistic. It's also a statistic that is rather less rosy than the statistics produced by the World Bank. What you see here is that the number of people who are chronically undernourished has gone up pretty consistently since the middle 90s. And I've flagged the number from the middle 90s in red simply because that was the time in 1996 when the world's governments came together in Rome for the World Food Summit. And they promised that they would half the number of chronically undernourished people by 2015. That number has never gone down one inch. It's gone up ever since and it's reached above a billion for the first time in all of human history in the year 2009. I bet that most of you did not know that. It's not a statistic that you find often in the media. Now, let's think a little bit about how we can morally engage with these sad facts in terms of human rights and human responsibilities. This is a topic that was very close to the heart of Dr. Arjun Sengupta. Now, when you think about unfulfilled human rights and your responsibilities with regard to them, you could divide that into three different possibilities. There are some human rights deficits for which you have no responsibility. For example, they occurred hundreds of years ago, long before you were born. There are other human rights deficits where you could do something to avert them. You could take action in pursuit of a positive duty to help protect and fulfill, in the language of the United Nations, those human rights. And finally, there are what we philosophers call the negative duties, where in some cases you are related to a human rights deficit as somebody who was causally contributing to it, who was involved in making it happen, who was failing to respect human rights. So these are the three ways in which, the three ways in which one might be connected to a human rights deficit. Now normally we think about human rights in interactional terms. We think of human rights as had by individual and collective agents with regard to human beings. So we think of governments violating human rights or police officers or armies at war. And they do that through the action that they take, through particular policies or through particular initiatives. And here we might postulate five conditions to find that a human rights violation has occurred. They have to be unfulfilled human rights. They have to be causally traceable to human agents. There has to be active agency on the part of those agents. They have to be acting in an official capacity, at least that's what most people would also add to the conditions. And finally, the agent must intend or foresee, or at least be in a position to foresee, that the conduct that he or she engages in will lead to the human rights deficit. Now, I want to propose that we can, in analogy to that, also think of rules or institutions or practices as being human rights violating. So here we would have five parallel conditions. We would say that there must, of course, be a human rights deficit. This deficit must be causally traceable to certain social rules or to a certain institutional order, institutional arrangements. There must be an active individual contribution on the part of people to designing or imposing these social rules. The rules have to have 
a certain official character. They have to appear with a claim, perhaps, of moral legitimacy, a duty of compliance. And finally, those who participate in designing or upholding these rules have to intend or foresee or be in a position to foresee that these rules will cause the human rights deficit in question. Now, we can then say that an institutional order, an arrangement of rules or institutions is human rights violating or non-compliant with human rights when the following four conditions hold. The order is associated with a massive human rights deficit, which is reasonably avoidable through some alternative design of the same institutional order. The deficit is foreseeable and its avoidability is also foreseeable. So if you apply this to a country, if a country is so organized, is so structured in terms of its social institution, that foreseeably a large human rights deficit persists in that country. And if it's also possible to rearrange these institutions, to reform them, to revise them in such a way that this deficit becomes much smaller or disappears, then we should say that the rules, the laws, the institutions of that country are human rights violating. And we should say the same at the international level, at the supranational level, that international rules and procedures and institutional arrangements can be human rights violating if alternative institutions are possible under which the existing human rights deficits would be much smaller or entirely avoided. Now this thought is not original with me, I have to confess. It's a thought that's already in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 28, which reads, everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. So my thought here is that in many countries today and in the world at large as well, we have an institutional order national, uh, international institutional order under which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration, in particular that important right formulated in Article 25, cannot be fully realized. And so the first and foremost imperative of reform should be to try to revise these institutions in such a way that human rights are fulfilled insofar as that is reasonably possible. So I'm proposing human rights then as a minimal conception of social justice, both for the national level and also for the global level. Insofar as we participate in the design or imposition of institutional arrangements that foreseeably and avoidably leave human rights unfulfilled, we are harming the interests of those whose human rights are unfulfilled and actually violating their human rights in contravention to a human rights-based negative duty not to harm others, not to violate their human rights. So this is a somewhat, certainly for Westerners, a somewhat unusual thought. And uh, how I would put it is that law, and in particular international law, is divided against itself. On the one hand, we have all these wonderful formulations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Covenants, various other human rights declarations. And on the other hand, we have institutional structures built, for example, in the WTO system that systematically undermine the fulfillment of the very human rights that are formulated in the other parts of international law. So international law has a wonderful ambition to realize the human rights of all human beings everywhere, but many of the structures that are built outside that vision are structures that systematically undermine the fulfillment of that very vision. Now many people, again, in particular where I come from in the Western states, many people think that this is just not likely to be true. They think that it's a conclusive argument against this view that global institutional arrangements contribute to the persistence of poverty that poverty is developing very differently in different countries. So they argue that 
because China, for example, has achieved a tremendous reduction in poverty, and because there is this wide diversity in the evolution of poverty in different countries, it must be local factors, maybe national or municipal or provincial or whatever, some local factors that account for the persistence of poverty where it persists. It can't be our global institutional order because that's the same for everyone. Now, let me give a conceptual answer to that argument. The argument sounds good, but it's a simple non sequitur. It has nice premises, but the conclusion doesn't follow. And the quickest way to show you that the conclusion doesn't follow is to tell you something about my home university, Yale, where unlike this university, there is a wide diversity of performance among the students. So not everybody performs really well, but at the end of the semester, some students have learned a lot and others rather little. Now that diversity, of course, shows that the teacher is irrelevant to student success, right? Well, by the same reasoning. If diversity of performance of developing countries in terms of poverty shows that global factors are irrelevant, then surely diversity in performance of students in a classroom shows that the teacher is irrelevant. They all have the same teacher. Okay, so that's not a good argument, right? So what do we say about the situation of the teacher? Obviously, it's possible, despite the diversity that we are observing in the classroom, that a better teacher would have created much better performance by all the students. It's also quite possible that the teacher, by selecting different teaching materials and a different teaching style, would have engaged better with some students who did poorly and maybe worse with some students who did well. And finally, it's also possible that the teacher might have, through his or her conduct, been motivating some students very well and others poorly so that even the student-specific factors that contributed markedly to student success or failure are ultimately due to the teacher. So for example, if the teacher is very sexist and discouraging of women students, then that may turn off a lot of the women students and reduce their performance. But it's not about anything to do with women's intrinsic capacities, but it's their motivation that was reduced by the teacher's conduct. So in all these different ways, the teacher can have a very strong influence on the performance of the students, even if we observe that the performance varies substantially from one student to the other. So I think that this shows at least that there is space, despite the observed diversity of poverty trajectories, for the global institutional order to play a significant role in explaining the persistence of poverty. And here you can see a number of the particular institutional arrangements that I've analyzed in various published writings that I think contribute markedly to the persistence of poverty. The protectionist grandfathering under the WTO rules, the pollution rules that allow the benefits of pollution to go to the rich while the poor bear most of the uncompensated harms from pollution, illicit financial flows that suck out of poor countries about 10 times as much money each year as goes back in in terms of development assistance, the absence of labor standards that would preclude the race to the bottom that we now see with poor countries competing with each other for investment, and various other rules and regulations that are designed for the benefit of the global elite and are often quite harmful, not intentionally perhaps, to poor people. Now you see that in increasing inequality globally, but you also see the effect when you look domestically. This is some statistics about the development of, income, of the income distribution in the United States. We talked already about poverty in the US increasing. And once again, this is largely due to a very dramatic shift in the income distribution in the US. The bottom half of the US population has lost more than half its share of national household income, while the people at the very top have increased 
their share quite dramatically. The top one hundredth of one percent, that's 14,400 tax returns, have increased their share of U.S. household income sevenfold over a period of just 30 years. So there's a dramatic increase in inequality and an increase that defies the economics textbooks. We all know the Kuznets curve. Inequality goes up as a country develops and then goes down as industrialization completes. And exactly that happened in the United States until 1978 when the trend reversed course and inequality shot up to levels that are comparable to, if not higher than, they were at the end of the 1920s with the Great Depression. So how does this happen? Why is inequality increasing? To understand that, I think, we have to understand something about competitive or adversarial systems as we see them all around us. We have competition in the economy, in the financial markets, politics, international relations, in academia, in courts, in the media, and so on. And this competition is good in many ways. It keeps people focused on doing socially useful things because they get rewarded if they do them better than their competitors. But this works only if the competition is properly framed so that those who really do socially useful things get the rewards and those who do poorly in those terms do not get rewarded. And here is the problem. The problem is that in competitive systems, there are two fundamentally different ways of getting ahead. One way of getting ahead is to do what the competition prescribes, to just do better than others at the competitive games, creating something of social value that is rewarded. The other way of getting ahead is to try to influence the rules of the competition or the way these rules get applied. This is often called corruption. So what you do is you try to influence those people who set the rules or those who apply the rules in order to be rewarded for something that doesn't really deserve a reward, that isn't really socially useful. So in this sense, you might say there's an Achilles heel to all competitive systems, namely that they incentivize those who are competing potentially to spend some of their efforts on trying to corrupt the rules or the application of these rules. And in this way, these rules and those who referee them become themselves objects of the competition. When that happens, then competitive systems lose much of their charm, much of their effectiveness. And they do so in two different ways. On the one hand, resources that should be invested in creating something socially valuable are in fact invested in gaming, in regulatory capture. And secondly, in so far as these efforts succeed, of course, the rules will no longer track what is socially valuable. The rewards will be given out for things that are not worth rewarding, that are not socially valuable. And that then leads to a problem, a systemic problem of regulatory capture that often the richest players can divert the rules from socially useful purposes to purposes that they are better able to capture they can divert those who apply the rules to apply them in their own favor. They can essentially corrupt and influence the system in such a way that it is less effective at producing what is socially valuable. And as they become richer, as they benefit from this regulatory capture, their incentives to engage in regulatory capture and their ability to do so increase and that's why you get a spiral. At each round of the spiral, the rich and powerful are more able to influence the rules and the application, and therefore able to capture an ever increasing share of the product. And I think this happens in particular at the global level for two reasons. One is that the scale there is enormous. Capturing global rules is a tremendous price. If you can change a little bit the way the WTO rules are formulated, for example, in, to benefit your industry, to benefit your corporation or whatever, you can really make a huge return 
And so it's well worth a large investment to engage in regulatory capture at the global level. And the second reason is that, of course, our global rules are not particularly democratic in the way in which they emerge. In India, when the laws change, you know ahead of time exactly what is being contemplated. You can read up on the law that is being proposed. You can protest, if you like. You can take a stand for or against the legislation and so on. At the international level, much of the negotiation takes place behind closed doors. And it's very unclear, even exposed, who argued for what, how particular language got into the treaty text, and so on. And so here, it is quite easy for very well-connected, powerful agents to influence the relevant governments, including India, of course, to influence the negotiations in their own favor, and at the same time to leave no trace. So I think the stunning increase in inequality, both nationally in most countries and internationally that we've seen over the last 30 years, is in good part due to this one aspect of globalization, the shifting upward of the rules of the game from the national level to the global level. More and more of the important rules that govern our lives are now determined at the global level, where most of us, including privileged Westerners like myself, have no hope of exerting any influence, and where only a very small group of very powerful corporations, banks, industry associations, and so on, can hope to compete for influence. Now, if this diagnosis is right, what can we do? I should not leave you without at least a glimpse at what can be done to reverse this trend, or at least to retard it a little bit. What we need to do is, of course, to look for structural reforms. We have to learn to contest at that level. Most people who are concerned about the poverty problem take action at the individual level. They join NGOs, they go into the developing world, they go into poor villages. I'm sure that's very common in India as well. And try to protect the poor, try to help them, try to improve healthcare, sanitation, food supply, and so on. This is wonderful work, but it's also work that is, in a way, blowing against a much stronger wind. For one bad decision made about global institutional design, you need tens of thousands of people to help and work in the villages in order to make up for it. And so we also need to contest at the level of structural reform in order to try to reduce the headwind that is blowing into the faces of the poor and those who would help them to advance this objective of poverty eradication. So we need structural reform, and structural reform that effectively symbolizes the moral point that all human beings are equally important, that their interests matter, that institutions ought to be designed with an equal attention to the lives and well-being of all human beings in the world. We need reforms that are realistically feasible, and that means that they have to benefit also at least some segment of the global elite. We need reforms that are scalable, that can be started small and can then be expanded. We need reforms that tend to empower those whom we want to protect, so that they can find their own voice and fend for their own interests. And we need reforms that are first steps in a path of reform that can ultimately reverse this system, systematic spiral that I showed you. So one reform that I've been working on for the last five years or so, which I want to quickly introduce, is the Health Impact Fund idea. The Health Impact Fund is a complement to the TRIPS agreement, which prescribes uniform intellectual property standards everywhere in the world, namely 20-year product patents for pharmaceuticals, for example. It allows pharmaceutical innovators voluntarily to register any of their new medicines and promises to reward them upon registration annually for 10 years on the basis of the global health impact that this medicine achieved. The Health Impact Fund would be funded by willing governments and ultimately perhaps by an endowment and would not require registrants to give up any intellectual property rights but 
only require them to sell the product anywhere in the world at the lowest feasible cost of manufacture and distribution. The health impact fund system as a parallel track to the usual system where innovators get rewarded by monopoly markups has three important advantages. The first is that all medicines that are registered with the health impact fund would be very cheaply available from the first day. Medicines are cheap to produce, really quite cheap to produce, small quantities of chemicals that you can mass produce. And so why not have them available for people at the cost of manufacture, actually at the cost of mass manufacture. Currently, the prices of medicines are extremely high, and you can see here why. Because inequality in the world is great, a monopolist will choose a very high price in order to maximize the product of the markup multiplied by the sales volume. If the demand curve, as here depicted, is very steep, then it's not worth it for innovators to price their medicine so that people in the bottom 85% of the world's population can afford it. It's much more lucrative for them to price it at a very high price, gaining a huge markup from only 15% of the population in preference to a much, much smaller markup from 60 or 80%. The second advantage of the health impact fund system would be that it would end the neglect of the diseases of the poor. Some of the largest health impact rewards could be gained from finding solutions to diseases that are almost entirely confined to the poor, such as malaria, tuberculosis, pneumonia, schistosomiasis, Chagas disease, and so on. These diseases currently are not lucrative targets of pharmaceutical research, but would become so if the health impact fund existed. You can see that here, that most pharmaceutical research money goes for a small set of diseases that are not particularly damaging, that are concentrated among the world's rich. Finally, the third important advantage would be that the health impact fund would also help overcome the huge infrastructure problems that stand in the way of proper medical delivery among the poor. Problems such as a lack of doctors and nurses, a lack of diagnostic equipment, a lack of refrigerators and electricity, and so on. It would help because innovators get paid for health impact, and so they have a vested interest in getting their product to the end user in a way that really brings therapeutic benefits. And so every obstacle between my product and therapeutic benefits is a money-losing obstacle for me. So pharmaceutical companies with products on the Health Impact Fund are hereby incentivized to collaborate with health systems, with NGOs, with international agencies, and so on, to overcome these infrastructure problems and to help with the efficient delivery of their products to the poor. Yeah, I think I'll skip the price thing because that's a little complicated and come to the last slide. So one of, my, of the many purposes of my visit to India this time was to try to prepare a pilot in India. So what we are hoping to do is find a good medical product really needed by poor people, a jurisdiction where it is needed, so that we can pilot the health impact fund concept to bring that medicine very, very cheaply to the population within that jurisdiction and then to reward the innovator, the person who owns the intellectual property on the product, according to the health impact that that company achieves. So thank you very much.